Good morning, everyone, and welcome to yet another of our Veil at Home online Sunday services. This morning, it's Remembrance Sunday, which is very different mm. this year, of course, with yeah. no parades mm. and no church services with congregations, yeah. sadly. Yeah. But later in our service, we will be remembering those who have died or who have suffered in the two world wars and mm. all who have been affected by war or acts of terrorism yeah. since then and holding a two minute silence. This week, we will be continuing with our series on what is church, and we will be thinking about it being reconciling. Neil is leading us in our sung worship. Sherry is doing our kids' own slot. Steve will be leading our act of remembrance. Chris is bringing our reading from 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 22. And Alan Dinney, who's from Bed uh, Brom Baptist, is preaching. And Heather will be leading us in a time of prayer. Mm. Uh, this morning we're going to have our notices and birthdays at the beginning just to keep everybody mm. on their toes mm. yeah, and so uh, just a couple of notices uh, the Macmillan coffee morning a big thank you to all those who attended and managed to raise 150 pounds that's well brilliant. done well everybody done. that's really, really good. good and then just the second notice on church leadership uh, church members you should have received the nomination forms for two places on the leadership team. There's a, a short explanation on the role of a church leader, charity trustee, a list of who can be nominated and a nomination form. And just a reminder of the process, just please, please prayerfully consider who you believe would serve the church well as a, a church leader, as a charity trustee. And then having done that, please contact the person to see if they're agreeable to, to standing uh, you might just want a conversation about if they're having a sense of whether God is calling them to, to the role. And then if you can find two other church members uh, who would be happy to support that uh, nomination. Uh, we can't obviously uh, meet together and sign things. So if you just put the church members names down, that will be fine. Now that still leaves those people who are supporting the nominations to be able to make two nominations of their own. Um, the process hopefully is explained in the uh, the paperwork that's come out to you but any nominations if you can let um, Heather have them by the 20th of December and then we'll be electing uh, some new church leaders at our January church meeting we'll let you know the date of that as soon as we can do. Sounds a bit complicated but yeah, I'm sure it's okay. all explained well and yeah. uh, we should get our and head ready. Just, just to remind people that it is a change from the last time we've done that because we have changed our constitution to come in line more with the BU constitution. Okay, birthdays. This week it's two, we've got two mm -hmm. birthdays. Sammy Parslow, that's Rachel's son on, I think it's today, the today? 8th of yeah. November. And Margaret, happy birthday to mm, you, Margaret, yeah. on Saturday the 14th of November. So we're going to sing mm. happy birthday to you yeah. too. I'm sure you'll both have a lovely time, yeah. although it's very different. Mm. Okay, so happy birthday to Sammy and to Margaret. Off we go. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sammy and, and Margaret. Margaret. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, to Jesus be true, may God's richest blessings abide upon you. Happy birthday. Yeah, have a lovely day each of you. And so we come to our call to worship. Creator and ruler of the earth, we lift up our voices, our eyes, our hearts, our lives to you in praise. Make us your alleluia people. Continue to form in us your new creation that we might welcome you to be more to, to more fully become the ruler of our hearts and minds through him who came as a servant and who now reigns over all creation, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're now going to hand over to Neil for a time of sung worship. Good morning on this Remembrance Sunday. And as I sing this to you today, the sun is shining and it's a glorious day. And Lord, as we remember all that the Lord has done, and uh, think of all those people that have sacrificed so much and continue to sacrifice things to set others free, we want 
to remember that it is God that deserves all the glory. It's him that's in control. He hasn't stepped off the throne. He hasn't gone on holiday. He isn't hiding. He's there. And he deserves all glory and honour. And it's him that we want to set our vision, to set our vision for this coming week. It's him that we today we want to give our vision and our attention to. We're going to sing a couple of good old hymns now that remind us that God is the one who deserves our all. To God be the glory.
Good morning, I hope you are all well and I hope you are enjoying being back at school. Now this morning I thought we'd do something different. I thought we could go on a journey and we're going to go on a journey with the Bible and we are going to see some of the ways in which God remembers and what it means for us and some of the ways God forgets and what that can mean for us too. Now I wonder if you can see this tiny little bottle. Now I wonder what might actually go in here. So what about tears? In Psalm 56 David writes, you have stored my tears in a bottle and counted each of them. In other words God knows and remembers everything that happens to us, particularly when we are in times of trouble and despair. Elsewhere, you can read that God remembered Rachel and Hannah when they couldn't have children and God answered their prayers. In the same book, God remembered Abraham, who was distressed that his nephew had been captured in a war and God came to help. God remembers us in our troubles. He knows exactly what's happening to us. So we can trust that God will rescue us and come close to us when we are facing trouble. Now my next item I've got is this, it's a book, it's a journal. So in the Bible, it tells us that God has something called a book of life. And this is where God remembers all that happens so that he can remember us. At the end of the Old Testament, there is a lovely promise in the book of Malachi, where it says, all those who truly respected the Lord and honored his name started discussing these things. And when God saw what was happening, he had their names written in a reminder in his book. God knows and remembers all our prayers, our hopes and our longings all the work we have tried to do for him, even though sometimes it does go wrong. God will keep his promise. He will not rub us out of his book of life. So God remembers us by name. God remembers us in trouble. And God remembers that we, what we have all done. The next thing I've got is this just a blank piece of paper with ink spots all over it. God doesn't actually really ever forget. God can't forget because he knows everything that was, is and will be. When the word forget is used in the Bible according to God, it is God chooses not to remember. The big things that he chooses not to remember is the mess that we can make of our lives. He says, so both in the Old and New Testament, it is in Jeremiah 31, where God says, I will forget the evil things they have done. In other words, God will forget our sins, our failures, mistakes and mess ups that we make of things. But how can he do this? This is how. Because of this, the cross. It's a mystery, but because of what Jesus did on that cross by dying innocently, this can put right all of the injustice in the world, in our lives, and that can give us a fresh start. The next thing is bread. To experience a fresh start, so because God forgets our sins, we need to remember, to remember what Jesus has done for us. He gave a very simple way of doing that as we break bread and as a way of remembering that Jesus was broken and wanted to be inside each and every one of us. Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. So God remembers our name. He remembers our troubles. He remembers our hard work and our faithfulness. And because of the cross, God chooses not to remember the mess that we make of our lives. But actually, there's one more mystery about remembrance. 
and it's this jigsaw pieces a jigsaw the word remember actually means to put back together a member is a part of something like a member of a club and to remember is to put it back together to reassemble something so remembering is putting back together something from long ago so we can see it now in our heads as a memory god promises to remember us to put us back together once again we need him to put us back together on the cross jesus was asked by the thief at his side to remember me in other words to put him back together again and make him into the person that he was always meant to be. Now today is a special day. It's called Remembrance Sunday. And I wonder if you all know what this is. It's a poppy. Now the poppy serves as a reminder this week that we and celebrate a very important day, Remembrance Day. On this day is when we honour the men and women who have served in the military and have fought to defend our freedom. The poppy was chosen as a symbol for Remembrance Day because it reminds us of a place called Flanders Fields, where many soldiers from the First World War were buried. The poppies grow wild there between all of the crosses that mark their place. We enjoy a lot of freedom. We are free to come to church and to worship. We are free to choose what we want to be when we grow up. We are free to choose where we want to live. We are free to choose most of the things that affect our daily lives. This might come as a surprise to you, but did you know that actually freedom isn't free? Someone had to pay the price for us to have freedom that we enjoy today. There are men and women among our church that, who have helped to pay that price. Some of them will have served in the military and some of them may have fought in wars. And there are probably some people in our church who had loved ones who gave their lives fighting for our freedom. These are the ones that we honour as we celebrate Remembrance Day. We have a lot of freedom, but actually the greatest freedom we have is in Christ Jesus. The Bible teaches us that the penalty for sin is death, but you and I have been set free from that penalty. We have been set free because Jesus paid that price and that penalty. Jesus' Bible tells us that Jesus died to set us free from the penalty of sin. Instead of death, we have been given eternal life. This freedom wasn't free. Jesus paid that for us. This week, as we remember Remembrance Day, let us remember to stop and thank God for those who have paid the price for our freedom. Let us also remember to thank God for Jesus, who set us free from the penalty of sin, because he was willing to pay the price. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for the freedom we enjoy. We are thankful to those who have paid the price of that freedom. And even more important, we thank you for the freedom we have because Jesus was willing to pay the price of the penalty for our sin. Amen. Hope you have a good week at school, guys. Speak to you soon. We now come to our act of remembrance, to remember and honour those who died or suffered in the two world wars and all who have been affected by war or acts of terrorism since then. All of the words that we say together will come up on the screen. We start with a time of confession. In a world torn by hatred and war, we confess the sins by which we have broken God's law and grieved his heart. 
for the times when we chose to hurt others and not to love them. Lord, forgive us and help us. When we forget you and think we know best, Lord, forgive us and help us. When we ignore the needs of those around us, Lord, forgive us and help us. When we want to pay back wrong with wrong, Lord, forgive us and help us. And when we come to you asking for forgiveness and for strength to change our ways, Lord, hear us and help us. The poem in Flanders Field by John McRae. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place and in the sky the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up your quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw, the torch be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Let us remember before God and commend to his sure keeping the men and women of all nations who have died as a result of war, those who we have known and whose memory we treasure, those we never knew and those who died unknown. We will remember all who have lived in hope but have died in vain. The tortured, the innocent, the starving and the exiled, the imprisoned and the oppressed. I'd like to invite you now to stand if you're able and to take your poppy and place it beside your television or your computer or your CD player to remember people who you have loved and lost, both in war and in peace. They shall not grow old, as we who are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, or the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Now we come to our two minutes silence.
My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. This is my command, love each other. We'll have a time of prayer for those serving in the military and world leaders and peace and reconciliation later on in our service. Good morning. Today's reading is taken from 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 14 to 22. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Well, it's good to be with you this, this morning and to share in your continued series, asking the question, what is church? I think it was Dawn French that once quipped, the church is something people did before they invented garden centres. While we're living in these COVID days of significant restrictions, and we can so easily lose the rhythms of meeting together and worshipping together and online experiences are not quite the same. But God is not restricted. Jesus himself said, I will build my church. And we, we know that he is committed to that building process. It is as you've been looking at to different words to describe and to depict the church. Healing, serving, praying, loving, serving, uh, worshipping. Uh, we are coming to a further word today reconciling, being that reconciling community. It uh, assumes broken relationships that need to find healing, hope, restoration, enemies becoming friends. Today is Remembrance Sunday. We recall the horrors and the brutality and the loss of life of in two world wars and subsequent conflicts. We share in the poignant two minute silence and we wear poppies. And a verse that will be quoted uh, in many a memorial gathering is the words of Jesus. Greater love has no one than this, than he laid down his life for his friends. And yet the, the context of Jesus' words is so often forgotten. It was the, the vine and the branches there in John 15. And just the need to be rightly related to God and rightly relating to one another. And when that happens, we bear fruit. Fruit that lasts, fruit that remains, fruit that impacts the lives of others. I want you to turn to that passage that was read to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And there in verse 14, we're introduced to this passage on the reconciling community. For Christ's love compels us. This is the dynamic power of God at work. It is Christ's love that presses us in on all sides. It is a word that describes being held in its grip like a fever that grips hold of our bodies. The supernatural love of God is to enfold us and empower us. As Paul has said in Romans 5.8, God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, 
baptized in his love. It is transformative. And this is what Paul picks up there in verse 17 of the passage. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Such a powerful experience that is pictured in the waters of baptism. We die uh, to our past where we rise to the new life in Christ. New life, new lifestyle. Changed attitude, changed actions. And this is all part of being this reconciling community. And in verse 18, Paul says we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. And he talks about being reconciled to God. That is the, the key. We all have a different story, don't we, of how we came to personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it was about two enemies becoming friends. Before we became Christians, we were the enemies of God. We had no desire to love, to honor, to serve, to obey. We had no desire to follow God's ways. We went our own way. We did our own thing. We had our own agenda to fulfill. All that changed as we discovered the greatness of God's love for us in Christ Jesus that could reconcile us to himself. And this is what Paul declares there in verse 19. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And we're so thankful. Why? Because not only were we enemies of God, but God was our enemy. And in bringing about reconciliation, God had to act in order to deal with his holy anger against sin in our lives. And this is where, in verse 21, Paul comes and he declares that God made him to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the divine exchange that takes place. As Peter shares in his letter, 1 Peter 3.18, Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring us to God. And in that bringing us to God, there is cleansing, there is forgiveness, there is hope, there is a new future. There is glorious reconciliation. We're reconciled to God. It is a picture of the prodigal son returning to the waiting father to be embraced and to be restored. And yet the call here in the ministry of reconciliation is to be reconciled not only to God, but to one another. And I believe that's inside the church, and we could also say outside of the churches as well. Let's think about inside the church. Remember the verse where two or three people gather together? It's been translated further. There is a mess. And I love that uh, title that is so often used for evangelistic work in churches with families and children, Messy Church, because church can be messy. I've been in pastoral oversight of churches for 44 years, and I know the mess that there can be because we're a community of sinners. Yet remember what Jesus himself said, Matthew 5, verses 23 to 24. You know, when we're bringing our gift to the altar, as Jesus puts it, if we realize there's something or someone has something against us, we're to get that sorted out. Leave the offering there at the altar. Wait, uh, sort it out, and then return reconciled, and your offering will be well received by God. Reconciliation goes beyond simply forgiveness. Remember the experience of Philemon and Onesimus, his runaway slave, ripped him off. Onesimus came to faith uh, through meeting Paul, and ultimately Paul sent him back to Philemon. I'm sending back your slave, but I'm sending back your brother in Christ, and gave him the challenge of what it means to be reconciled. But it is as we think about reconciliation, uh, there is this message of reconciliation that Paul talks about. 
there in verse 18, he's committed to us, to the church of Jesus Christ, this message of reconciliation. We have a power-packed, life-changing message to share in the unchanging gospel of good news. This is the great commission to go out into all the world and to preach the gospel. And Paul comes there in verse 20, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. It's as though his whole being ached longing that others would come to know the, the, the wonder of being in a right relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the cross. And what Paul describes is a call to be ambassadors of King Jesus. We're to partner with God, speaking not for ourselves, but for Christ. God making his appeal through us. Christ's love indeed compels us with this life-changing message. Let us not forget this message in these COVID days, but be committed to reaching out and sharing with others the glorious gospel. I think in this whole area of reconciliation and being a reconciling church, we're to be committed to building up relationships rather than breaking them down. I sometimes see a practical outworking just in ordinary everyday life as we go about our duties in the community, in our place of work, in the office, in the factory floor. When someone speaks against another person and communicates that to us, do we join in the negativity or do we actually try to, to move the agenda in a different direction and be more positive, more reconciling? I believe there is a ministry that Christians can have to be a reconciling community uh, there even in the workplace, uh, being able to build up rather than break down relationships. And being a reconciler can indeed be hard work. It doesn't come easily, but being a mediator is what God calls us to, to actively pursue the, the reconciling gospel of hope. Well, we are called to be reconciled and also called to be reconcilers. It was in 1940, during the war, that Coventry was bombed and the cathedral was devastated, became just a heap of ruins, a few walls left. And they pursued building a new cathedral, which was great. And many of you have seen the new cathedral, I'm sure. But one thing they decided to do is to not seek revenge, but to seek to be a reconciling community. And the Coventry Cathedral to this day is committed to have at its heartbeat this desire to be and exercise a ministry of reconciliation in all areas of conflict and discord. May it be that even our own church family here at Vale Community Church, the heartbeat is of a reconciling community seeking to reach out, be reconciled, be reconcilers to the glory of God. Amen.
this morning in our prayers. We want to pray in particular for those serving in the military, for world leaders and for peace. So we pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we bring before you all of those who are serving in the military in whatever capacity. We commit to your protection those serving in hostile environments. Will you give them wisdom and integrity? For those facing the unknown, will you give them courage? For those struggling with physical exhaustion, would you give them strength? And for those serving in desperate situations, would you give them hope? And for those instructed to fight, would you give them wisdom, honour and integrity? In your mercy, Lord, stand alongside them. Sovereign Lord, we ask that your spirit will comfort the families of those serving in the military as they miss their loved ones. May they be protected by your strength, encouraged by your word and led by your love. We ask that you would keep them from loneliness, fear and anxiety during these testing times. In your mercy, would you help each family member to trust in you and will you give them your peace? Stand with them, Lord. Father, we thank you for appointing leaders to take our world forward. We ask that your word and spirit would guide them in power to lead as Jesus led. We pray for an end to conflict and for a time of peace to come in this world. Lord, would you have mercy on those caught up in the conflict and deliver the nations in your mercy. Stand with them, Lord. Almighty God, who through your prophets foretold of a day when swords would be beaten into plowshares and that salvation would come through Jesus making peace through his blood shed for us. Will you pour out your spirit on all people everywhere so that we may be delivered from hate, hostility and self-seeking and would find peace in your will. In your mercy, Lord, make us instruments of your peace, that your name may be hallowed, your kingdom come, and your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And as we conclude our prayers, we pray for reconciliation. O oh God of Shalom, so often we have built up walls to protect ourselves from our enemies. But those walls have also shut us off from receiving your love. Break down those walls. Help us to see that the way to your heart is through the reconciliation of our own hearts with our enemies. Bless them and us, that we may come to grow in love for each other and for you, through Jesus Christ. Loving Lord, you have reconciled us in Christ Jesus and have given us the ministry of reconciliation. We pray for all those for whom we are estranged. Bring healing to strained or broken relationships. Forgive us for the times we have wronged others, whether by ignorance, neglect or intention. Grant us the courage and the grace to seek their forgiveness where others have wronged us. 
Grant us a gracious spirit that we might forgive, even as we have been forgiven in Christ Jesus. And Father, help us to realise that all striving after justice must begin with ourselves and not with others. Help us to make for those who work for peace and seek always to express your love in the world. Help us to encourage the spirit of reconciliation by being those who forgive rather than those who try to establish their rights. We ask all these things in the name of the one who forgave those who persecuted him, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. That's the end of our online service this week. So thank you for joining us again this morning via YouTube, DVD and CD. And we hope that you'll do the same again next week. We're going to leave you now with our final song, And Can It Be, which says in its last verse, No condemnation now I dread, Jesus and all in him is mine, alive in him my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Jesus' death has led to our reconciliation with God. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, thank you, Lord. And uh, this, as usual, will be followed by various information slides. But we thought this week we would end with a said blessing. And uh, this is the blessing from Northumberland Community Morning Prayer. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen. Amen. So it's goodbye from us. Bye. God bless. Stay safe. See you next week. Bye. Bye.
the journey Come wait a while, stay a while Welcome you'll be Come all you questioners Looking for answers And searching for reasons And sense in it all Come all you fallen And come all you broken Find strength for your body And food for your soul Come to the feast There is room at the table Come let us meet in this place 